Hi everyone, it's Joe here from Lawn Solutions Australia and welcome to another episode of Turf Talk. Today we're trying something a little bit different. We've got a guest uh, from industry, someone who's been in the turf industry for a very long time now across all facets. So it's going to be great to get an insight. Um, what he does now is he actually works for our company, Lawn Solutions Australia. So we're joined by our national business manager, Simon Adaman. Simon, how are you going today? Good day, Joe. How are you? Yeah, it's good, good to be in yeah, It's good. It's good. So what we're going to do is because you've had such a diverse range of jobs over a number of years, we might wind straight back to the beginning and find out how you actually got into turf. So you're a greenkeeper initially? Yeah, Joe. It's quite interesting actually. My brother started in the greenkeeping industry. He's about seven years older than me. And when he was in it, I spent a bit of time on school holidays and weekends. Um, and that was in bowling on bowling clubs or bowling greens in those days. And then when I left school, I, um, I worked for 12 months at a cut price store packing groceries and thought, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Wow. So I got into, um, I, got, I was lucky enough to get a job at Balmoral Bowls Club in Brisbane as an assistant greenkeeper. And that's where I started, really. And that was back, I don't want to tell you my age, but that was that was back some 44 years ago. Wow. Okay. You just won't comment there. But um, <laughs> so, but you played a lot of bowls too. So did the greenkeeping come from the bowls or the bowls came from the greenkeeping? Is that how you sort of got an interest in it? Or So, yeah, Joe, so what happens, I suppose there's a passion. When you start greenkeeping, you're looking after really fine cut, low cut turf. And then when you're working there, you're mowing and you're rolling greens, you actually have a passion for what's happening on a bowling green. So in your lunchtime and things like that, you'd go out and have a roll up and play a bit of bowls between yourselves and that. And that's how I got into it. So I probably started playing bowls 17, 18 years of age. And in those days, I was really young compared to bowls, I suppose, was really a retired sort of yeah. person's game and it's changed a lot now. So and, that's how I got into it. And divulge because you always brag about your bowls career. So, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your bowls career. All right, it was quite interesting. So I started um, and in the greenkeeping fraternity, you have national conferences and bowls championship weeks. So we started playing in those. And my brother and I, and I always played with my brother, mm. um, we were lucky enough to win um, – the Australian Championship for pairs. Yeah, right. And look, that was back in the 90s. Um, and then from there, I started playing for the club and um, playing pennants. And we're fortunate enough, we um, played Premier League for three years and we won the club pennant for three years in a row and it was unheard of of our club. Yeah. And I was also fortunate enough to win the club singles. So I was a club singles champion. So. Bowls was great. It was part of my life. I worked five or six days a week as a greenkeeper and then I'd play bowls on a Saturday afternoon and Sundays and travel playing bowls. So you still play? No, look, I haven't played competitive bowls for probably 15 years. Yeah, right. Is it something you think you'll venture back into? <laughs> probably not, no. The problem is I can't go and just have a social game. If I was to go and do it, You've got to get serious again yeah. and then you know it's going to take up a lot of time, weekends yep. and that. Yeah. And I, I think I've done that. I think you've done that. Yeah, yeah cool. So, so, so how long did you stay at Balmoral as a greenkeeper for? Was that the only place you were the greenkeeper at? No. So I started my greenkeeping career at Balmoral. I was there about 18 months to two years. Um, I did a, a course at TAFE College mm -hmm. because it wasn't an apprenticeship then. So I did a course at TAFE College, then it became an apprenticeship and I went back and did my apprenticeship through years of um, experience and recognition to get my okay, trade certificate. Right yeah. I left Balmoral and went to Cleveland Bowls Club down on the bay side of Brisbane and I went there as an assistant greenkeeper and then not long after going there, the greenkeeper left and I was given the opportunity to take over as, a, as the head greenkeeper. Yep. And that was a really good club because it was going through expansion at that time. We had two greens and then we were building the third green. So I built the third green for them and we changed all the grass from blue cooch in those days. Okay. We used to play on no, blue no. cooch yeah. across to Tiff Dwarf. So was that the time most of the clubs around there were changing from blue to green? Yes, it was. So when I first started at Balmoral, they were blue cooch greens. Okay. And... A blue cooch bowling green, a really good one, was beautiful. Yeah. It was just spectacular. Mm. But a lot of disease pressure and wear and, and things like that. And you can't spray blue cooch with a lot, can no, you? No, it, so. it was really restricted. Yeah. So that's when they made the um, choice, I suppose, to go to Tiff Dwarf. It was yeah. a better option, find a leaf, 
hybrid cooch, all of those types of Most things. Most of them are still tiffed off today, aren't they? Most, um, probably north of Sydney, a tiff dwarf, yeah. and there is some bent greens in the cooler, cooler yeah. areas. So we we changed everything to tiff dwarf at Cleveland, built the new green, and I was there for 14 years of my life okay. at, at, at Cleveland. So it was a great club on the Bay side, really progressive club. From there, I made a couple of poor business ventures. I um, built a tennis court for an American guy while I was there, uh-huh. and. Um, used to maintain it for him and got on really good with him. And then I invested in the company he owned, making tailgate ramps for the back of pickup trucks and they were all getting exported to the US. So I invested about $30,000 thinking this is a really good move in my life. I'm gonna get out of greenkeeping and work for this guy that's gonna sell stuff all over the world. Well, that job lasted. I left greenkeeping to go after I invested money, it lasted six weeks and he went bust. For my greenkeeping life, I thought, what have I done? So 14 years, I've put 30000 or $35,000 into it, lasted six weeks. So I, I had nothing and I, we just had a new baby. So it was, it was pretty sort of I <laughs> challenging. Ne- I never, I've known you a long time, I've never known that. Yeah, pretty yeah. challenging part of my life. So through my greenkeeping career, I met a guy called Paul Asher and he owns a business called Australian Turf Machinery. Right. And he was chasing me to work with him. So when this happened, I rang him and I said, hey, Paul, how's it, have you got a job? He said, you can start on Monday, come pick up your van. Okay. And that's how I got into sales. Right, right. So that's that's the next transition we're going to talk about now. I think you made a transition that a lot of people in our industry make, which is from a greenkeeping background, whether that's bowls or, go- or golf, into a chemical fertiliser sale. So that was the next move for you as well, was it? So, yeah, and again, as I just said to you, it was probably never planned, but that's how it happened. That's how I it needed, happened, yeah. I needed to have a job and I got into sales, again, dealing with bowling clubs mm-hmm. but selling turf machinery like right. mowers and rollers and things like that, accessories for bowling clubs. I did that for about 15 months and travelled a fair bit of um, Queensland and ACT for them. And then I was fortunate enough to be given an opportunity with a company called Chemspray in those days. And Chemspray was a privately owned company and they used to service golf and bowls. So I took that job selling chemicals and fertilizers and everything. Over a period of time with Chemspray, it got bought out and then it went to Chemturf and then got bought out and went to New Turf. Right. So I was in that role for 18 years of my life started as a sales, a territory manager, looking after a set territory. I was then made the Queensland manager for the business. And then for the last eight years I was there, I was a national manager and looked after all their export business as well. So that that brings us up to about 2012? 2013, I think it was. 2013. Yep. So for those that don't know, New Turf or Amgrow is probably one of the, if not the largest, uh, distributors of fertilisers, chemicals and that sort of thing to the turf farming, sports turf, golf course industry around Australia and to be a national manager, that's a, a pretty big deal. And just just jumping back a step, how did your years, your 14 years or uh, approximately 14 years that you did in the bowls world actually on the coal face of that industry help later on through relationships? Was there? A, it would have been a pretty important base to build moving into a role like a, like a sales manager at New Turf. I think – Coming from the industry that you've worked in really gives you a good grounding to go to the next level into selling. So you understand turf, you can talk to your customer on the basis that you know grass, you haven't come from the outside and telling a tradesperson what they're doing when you're a tradesperson yourself. Yeah. So it's really good to be able to do that. What was was good about it was that I, over the period of time in the 14 years, I think it's really important when you're in an industry to get involved, don't isolate yourself to your own environment. Yep. Get involved and work with with the industry, associations and things like that. You get to meet a lot of people, attend conferences, and that's how that industry works is you go to conferences, you build relationships and you have them forever. So I may not have seen a customer, but I'd talk to them on the phone in Canberra and do business with them because you knew them. So I think that's really important. because I know now when we go to conferences now, we have a running joke that you know absolutely everybody there, uh, but you've built a lot of relationships over time and it helps 
it doesn't matter where you go in our industry now, you seem to find a connection with someone from 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's a pretty special thing. <laughs> Turf's a funny thing. It's, it's, it's it, I don't know, it, it must be in your blood, but it doesn't matter what part of the industry, whether it be bowls, golf, councils, turf farms, whatever, mm. you meet people and you all have the same mm. basic knowledge of grass. Yeah. And you can talk on all different levels, whether it's high cut turf, low cut turf, whatever. Mm. You can talk to people because you've come from that experience. Yeah. The sales thing is really important and one of the things that I did and one of the philosophies I, I always um, believed in at New Turf, if we ever employed a new sales rep at New Turf, we would always take them from the industry yep. and bring them into New Turf and train them mm -hmm. and that worked really successful. Yeah. There's a lot of people out in the industry now that over the years at New Turf that I employed that have come through and are really successful in that. And that was my philosophy is take them from the industry and bring them into sales. But it's a great thing if, you, if you're working in an industry like ours, particularly green keeping, superintendent, whatever, there is a path for you. It's not just you're stuck there for the rest of your life. Some people may love it and, and good on for doing that, but some people may want to move on to something different. And that's probably the natural path in our industry, isn't it? I, I think so. Um, you have superintendents at golf courses that have been at golf courses for 40 years and they're so passionate about it and do an awesome job. Yeah. Then the other path is get as much experience as you can mm -hmm. and then travel overseas. Yeah. So a lot of people do that. They'll travel overseas and get experience from traveling overseas and then come back to Australia. Yeah. Or the other path is be trade, trade qualified, experienced, but then go into sales. And learning sales just gives you another level of, of knowledge, how to deal with people, relationships. And, and look, I don't regret any of it my whole life being involved in that. It's, it's, it's been great. And it, it's a pretty fascinating sort of journey that you've been on. And your time at New Turf, 18 years, I think you said. 18 um, years, yeah. And you did a lot of traveling. You handled a lot of business in New Zealand. You got to move around a bit. So New Turf, I... I'll be really, I suppose, honoured to be given the opportunity at New Turf. It was really good grounding. It was a great time. There was a lot of training on products. There was a lot of training on sales. So they really looked after their staff to develop their staff. Yeah. Um, again, I had the opportunity to travel around Australia with New Turf. I then looked after some overseas business for them. I looked after Singapore um, business, which was existing mm -hmm. and would, would grow the Singapore business. And then there was New Zealand business, which was all new business. And that again comes back to where you were talking. I met the guy from New Zealand at the golf conference in Melbourne, yeah. had a coffee with him. And within a month I was on an aeroplane to New Zealand wow. and set that business up. And it was a zero business. And when I left New Turf, it was probably worth a four and a half million dollar business. It's, it's funny how, so, how important the relationships you strike up are. You never know where mm. it's gonna lead you. And it's always good to be a part of things like conferences and trade events. It's unreal. And what, what's happened since then is one of the sales reps that was in New Zealand, a guy called Steve Jones, wanted to come to Australia. So when I was at New Turf, one of the last things I did before I left was I employed him with New Turf in Western Australia. Right. And he moved his whole family to Western Australia. Wow. So there, so it gave him a future. He wanted to get out of New Zealand and come to Australia and he's still there today yeah. and he's a successful um, sales. I think he's a state manager now for GTS, Greenway yeah, okay. Turf Solutions, yeah. in WA and loves the place. So, yeah, great. So I set up the New Zealand business. Um, then my last 18 months at New Turf was in, um, they would acquire businesses. So mm -hmm. at that point in time, they acquired Equipment Solutions, which yep. is a machinery business, yeah. and then they acquired the Globe Turf business at that time as well. Mm -hmm. So the last 18 months was I worked on integrating those two businesses into the new turf business and how it would all work. Right. Um, and then I suppose my time was then Lawn Solutions. <laughs> so, that's a story in itself, so let's talk about that if you so want. So that's a pretty in different jump to make. So you you had a you know a high level position at New Turf. You'd been there for eighteen years. You were very very comfortable, and then suddenly you got a phone call to join a not a brand new company. The Sawalda brand had existed for some time, but essentially Lawn Solutions was a brand new company. So what were you thinking? Well, it was a brand new company, and it was quite funny. I was selling fertilizer to Gavin Rogers and Brent Redmond in the Sir Walter days to do all their buckets of fertiliser. So I, I had a relationship yeah. with Gavin and Brent, knew them. 
Gavin was probably one of the hardest customers I've ever dealt with. Um, there was always a problem with the fertilizer, but it was never his problem. Um, so it was just interesting. I'd flown back in from New Zealand one Friday afternoon and I was out walking the dog and I had a phone call from Gavin. And my first reaction was, what's the, what's, what's, what's the problem? What's he whinging about uh, today? Well, and he goes, I'm in Brisbane. I need to talk to you. Um, it's not about fertiliser. Are you available next week? I want to fly up and have a chat. And I said, yeah, no problems. And that's how it all started. We spoke and um, I'd made pretty much made the decision straight away. And I suppose the support of my wife said, you've done 18 years, you can't do it. You've done everything you can achieve at, at New Turf. Why not take this opportunity? And, and, and what was your role initially? I know it's changed now. You, you do a lot of different things now, but what was your task initially? I know this is a brand new venture. Um, there was a lot of change going on in the industry at the time. What was your, what was your job well, apart from everything? I'm go, I'll, I'll tell you the story and you'll be probably horrified when I tell it to you guys is that um, my role was, and in Gavin's word is, I know I need to employ you but I don't have a job description. All I know is I need to employ you. Why don't you write your own job description and send it to me? Not, and not the traditional method. <laughs> and, and what's really funny, and I suppose it makes it, I, it was the time for me to move mm. in that sense is coming from a corporate company, when I heard that, it's, wow, corporate companies don't do those yeah. things. It's very, here's your salary package, here's your job description, it's all laid out. And then to be told, hey, I know I need to employ you, write your own job description. So I went home and wrote it. Golf, coffee. Yeah, junkets, whatever <laughs> you want to call it. You know, it's it's um, building relationships. I went home and wrote it and sent it to Gavin and Brent and within 20 minutes they said, yep, no problems. Wow. wow. So, so it was really simple in I, the end. I guess you started just travelling around and visiting everyone and trying to Sell Lawn Solutions, I guess. Is that the right way to put it? Or? Yeah, so I started before Lawn Solutions. It, it was in its infancy. It hadn't launched to the market. So it was about 12 months before. It was doing all the build-up to getting ready to launch. So I suppose I started with a clean slate of paper, had no direction in, hey, you need to do this, this and this. We had a lot of group meetings. Um but firstly, I think I, I travelled around Australia and we held meetings with the growers, making sure compliance, sign writing, accreditation, mm -hmm. getting all ready for launch. That was it. That was the first thing that we had to sort of do. Yeah. Um, and that was a lot of hard work in those early days, getting everybody to the launch day. Um, yeah. But it, it seemed to work. Well, with... I guess you'd be 10 years in now, wouldn't you? Probably probably slightly more. 10 years this year. So I started in uh, 2013 and 2023, yeah. so 10 years in. And what, what what's it looking like now? Is it looking how you sort of thought it would look like 10 years ago, the Lawn Solutions brand and how our members have adapted it? Or is it bigger than you thought, smaller than you thought? How do you see it today? Um, I think it's a lot more in-depth than I thought. Yeah. I, I believe probably the first 12 months and – the direction that set that first 12 months was probably the best thing that ever happened. It got consistency in branding yeah. and that branding 10 years later is still there and it's still driving ahead. Is it different to what I thought? Yes, 100%. I thought we would be just dealing with growers, members, resellers and things like that and they're the critical part of the business but the business has diversified in so many different ways and yeah. I suppose at that point in time 10 years ago, you couldn't really know where you were going to yeah, take it. Sure. The business has taken its direction yeah. and we've had to lead that direction and to be the most successful brand in the turf industry and have the best grasses is probably an honour to everybody in the business, how, yeah. it's, how it's worked. Yeah, I, I think the strength of Lawn Solutions is obviously our members um, oh. and, and, and you're lucky enough to travel around and see them. How have they changed um, since you started? By members, I mean, um, by members, I mean turf farms. Our members have changed significantly purely because I think we offer them more than we ever said we were going to offer them. And I think it's probably something that I learned in sales. Always deliver more than the expectation. And I think we've done that really well as a group. And our members, 
we're not just dealing with them from a law and solutions point of view. We help them with every aspect of their business. And again, it comes back to relationships. We all have really tight relationships with all our members, so we offer them a lot more. So we offer them marketing, R&D, grasses. We offer them employment services. There's a whole range of things that we offer our members, um, but they're the key link to everything we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just just one last thing that I guess we're going to sort of finish off with is not a lot of people know this, but if you've ever looked at our advertising or our marketing or our website and seen photos of a beautiful Sir Grange lawn, um, we're lucky enough to have our main sort of showcase Sir Grange lawn as one of our employees, Sir Grange lawns. That's your lawn. So obviously you've had a rich history with Coochers, um, both, both professionally and in your own place, but how do you get your Sir Grange looking so good and what do you like about it? Um, that's an interesting question, Joe. I was always coming off Tiff Dwarf off a of bowling green, loved cooch, and then in my old house we had just winter green cooch and I'd mow it with a cylinder mower and it used to look really good and I'd renovate it. Then when we built a new house, I thought, you know what, I need to put something different and at that point in time we had Sir Grange and I thought, I really want it. It's on sand. So we put it in. Um, I reckon after five years of being in, it'd be the easiest lawn I've ever looked after in my life. Yeah, right. And not being critical of people, but I, I think the social media platform's great to help people along, but I think people in today's world kill lawns with kindness. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah. So with the Sagrange, I don't fertilise it much. I, I just give it the bare minimum. Mm-hmm but it looks sensational all the time. It's great. I mow it with a cylinder mower. Probably from my greenkeeping days, I think the, the, the strongest emphasis on having a good lawn is your mower. And if that mower's not sharp and in good condition and cuts perfectly, that can cause a lot of grief. And mowing regularly be a big thing too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I love cylinder mowers. It's just probably part of my life from the bowling green days. Yeah. So I'm really passionate. I put a lot of time into making sure it's sharp every time I cut and the cut's just beautiful. But the Sagrange lawn, it's 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 perfect. I love it. Could I say I had some issues with it? The only issue I have with it is making sure before you lay it, you have everything's dead. It's yeah. You don't. If you get cooch in it, it's difficult to you get out. You don't want to be taking it out. You of it, don't yeah. want to be taking it out. But it's the easiest lawn I look up. I've you know easiest lawn I've ever looked after. I cut it at seven mils with a cylinder mower. Wow. Use Iron Guard Plus on it to get some colour. Mm-hmm. In winter, sometimes I'll put some colour guard on it. But other than that, I, I don't. I'd fertilise it once a year. Well, it's picturesque. It looks fantastic. Yeah. That's why we use it all the time. It, it really is a fantastic lawn. Well, we're going to wrap that up there. I'd. Say thank you, Simon. It's a really impressive story. It's a great journey you've been on, and you really are a, a, a credit to our industry. So um, I hope everyone you know gets a lot out of that. A lot of people listening will probably know you or would have seen you along the line somewhere. But um, thanks very much for sharing, and thanks for being on the podcast. No worries. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Cheers. Hey, you have the best podcast voice. Smashed it. How good does it sound?